This week, I had the opportunity to take care of some personal business uh, up in Utica, New York. And uh, so I got on a train on Monday morning at 6.30ish and arrived in Utica at about 7 o'clock, picked up my, uh, no, I guess I arrived around 5.40. So uh, uh, in Utica, picked up my rental car, drove to the hotel I was staying in, and at about five, at about 6.05, it began to snow. And it snowed all that night and the next day and the next day and the next day. And Thursday, the sun came out and then it snowed the next day and the next day. And I got back on the train yesterday morning at 7 o'clock and arrived home last night at 7 o'clock. And... Uh, I tell you that story because it's interesting to frame our lives in the sense of getting to look at life in a different way than we did before. Uh, I live in Northern Virginia where three snowflakes will shut the schools and uh, clear the shelves at the grocery store of bread and toilet paper. Listen, people, if you do not have enough toilet paper in your house, I do not know what's going on. Do you buy it on a roll-by-roll basis? I just don't get that. You know, uh, in any case, um, I, it snowed and it snowed. Well, the first thing I did on, on the Tuesday morning that I was there before I needed to be somewhere at noon was I, I always, when I'm in town, pick up snacks to keep in my room so I don't have to eat out all the time and all those kinds of things. So I go to the local super Walmart that has a grocery store, and I go in there, and lo and behold, it is snowing like wildfire outside, but there is lots of bread on the shelf, and there is lots of toilet paper. It is as if snow has no effect whatsoever on the life of Utica, not in the way it does, in the way it has an effect on life in Alexandria. And it gave me a new perspective. It reframed for me what snow means, depending upon where you live and how you live, in the midst of all these other kinds of pieces. And today what I'd like us to do as we continue our series about taking Jesus seriously is to practice reframing things, looking at things differently than perhaps we normally do. Because it's really easy to look at things one way and miss all the other ways. Now, we're going to practice something uh, to start with because I think sometimes if you move your hands and get kinetically involved you sometimes uh, remember things in a different way and it'll make you think about them during the week for better or for worse. So have you ever watched um, movies about making movies and you always see the director is holding up their hands like this to kind of frame a picture to try to get uh, an idea of of how it's going to look on, uh, on the big screen? They, they kind of focus their hands like this and then just look between their hands. I want you to practice with me for a moment, reframing your world and just look through your hands, not all the peripheral stuff, but just focus. So I want you to practice focusing on something. It doesn't have to be me. In fact, you might want to look anywhere else but me. So, uh, you know, focus on some piece. And do you notice how some of the other details begin to fall away when you focus in, when you get focused on a certain area. Well, as we begin to think about that, I want us to think and look together at, uh, at, at a story from the Gospel of Mark today about Jesus. And it begins in chapter 10 of Mark, verse 17. So let me give you a second to look that up because I noticed in my printed update today that one of the things I did not put in there for you was the scripture text. So it is Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 17, and just running through verse 22. And here's what it says in this particular version, the the Common English Bible. As Jesus continued down the road, a man ran up, knelt before him, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus replied, why do you call me good? No one is good except the one God. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. 
don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, don't cheat, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he responded, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. He said, you are lacking one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But the man was dismayed at this statement and went away saddened because he had many possessions. This is the gospel for this morning. Thanks be to God. I want to set a frame for you, first of all, and the frame for this is in chapter 8, verse 37 of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus sets his eyes towards Jerusalem. Everything that comes after that point is going to be extra serious about how, how he wants you to live your life. So when every encounter, there's not a lightness about it, there's a heaviness and one of the very first things that he says after he sets his eyes towards Jerusalem is he tells the disciples that the Son of Man has to, you know, suffer and die. And Peter says, that's bad news. I don't like that. And uh, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You know, uh, you just don't get it. You're thinking in human terms. I need you to think in uh, people. Uh, I need you to think in God's terms. And then he says that we need to lose our lives if we're going to gain it. We need to lose our lives if we're going to gain it. And so now this rich man, we, we didn't know he's, that's the title here, a rich man. We just know he's a man. We find out at the end that he's rich. He's got a lot of stuff. He has a lot of possessions. The truth is, he doesn't have a lot of possessions. A lot of possessions have him. He does not uh, possess those possessions. They possess him. They are more important to him than anything else. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that. So in our first framing moment, I want you to see this man running up. Because in good Jewish society, adult men, imagine long robes all the way to the ground, adult men do not run. They don't run. It's embarrassing. It's dishonoring. It's dishonoring to themselves. It's dishonoring to their cows. It's dishonoring to everyone around them. It's just dishonoring. You don't run. But what does this Jewish man do but run up to Jesus? We know he's a Jewish man because he's keeping the Ten Commandments. At least we find that out later on. So he runs to Jesus, kneels and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now I want you to hear something that you need to know about this word eternal life. In the 20th century, in the 21st century, maybe even in the 19th century, we began to reframe that word as if it was punching your ticket to heaven. Your ride past this life. After death, life after death. That's what we think of as eternal life. Eternal life does not begin when you die. Eternal life begins when we commit ourselves to living in the way of Jesus, to loving and serving and being a part of what he wants us to be in our lives. Eternal life does not begin when you die. It begins now. It begins in this moment. And the word for eternal life here really means the fullness of life. What Jesus wants for you is not just he wants you to have a powerful life. He wants you to have a full life. He wants you to experience life the way it's meant to be experienced. And he doesn't want you to wait until you die. He wants you to start experiencing it now. He wants you to see something now. So when this man asks for eternal life, what does it take to get this fullness of life? Jesus reframes it once again and says, listen, why do you call me good? This, in the end, is all about God. Now, who was Jesus? We know later on we fully understand son of God, son of man. We understand that kind of picture. But while he's alive, his whole life is about pointing somewhere else. And it's pointing to God. What would it look like if our lives always pointed to God in the same way Jesus pointed to God? If we took him seriously enough to recognize this life that we've been giving him, is a gift, and it's a gift that's meant to point all the time with every breath you take and every move you make. It is meant to point to God. 
sorry, Aunt, the police came to my mind when I said that. You know, uh, point to God. You are meant with your whole life to be a pointer. Now, if we're honest with each other, we're already falling short of taking Jesus seriously in that way because I don't always point to God. Sometimes I point to my own selfishness. Sometimes I point to my own disconnection with the rest of life. Sometimes I just, I point to almost anything sometimes but God. And I miss God in my everyday life. But Jesus is this divine pointer, and he makes his whole life not about him, but about something bigger than him, about God's kingdom, and about this God that he serves in his everyday life. And he wants us to see that, and he wants us to live that. So after he says, why do you call me good? Don't never forget to reframe this. This is about God. You know, this is about God, not just about my teaching, but about God. Then he tells them part of the Ten Commandments. Now he gives them six, one of which is not even one of the ten. Don't cheat, not one of them. You know, it's not one of the Ten Commandments. Five of them are, you know, don't murder. I mean, some of them seem less kind of obvious. I mean, you know, listen, you want to follow God, you want to, you want to inherit eternal life, you want to live to your fullest, then don't go murder people. <laughs> yeah, that just seems pretty clear. I mean, I, you know, I mean, uh, at the very minimum, <laughs> come on, if I want to inherit eternal life, of course I ought not to go around just randomly killing anybody who gets in my way with my vehicle or not when they cut me off. Uh, don't commit adultery. Don't be unfaithful. You know, don't steal. That makes sense. Don't give false testimony about somebody else and honor your father and mother. So, and then, of course, don't cheat, which is not really one of the ten, but it is part of the Torah. You should never cheat one another. He lists those, and then you can almost see the man who's having this conversation with Jesus just puff up just a little bit, just a little bit. You know what? I've done that my whole life. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't stolen. I haven't cheated. You know, uh, I haven't given false testimony about anybody. And I honor my father and mother. I got this in the bag. You know, you can almost hear that. I've got that in the bag kind of thing. And then Jesus uh, looks at him. And I want you to here, because it's only in the gospel. This story is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Slightly different phrasing, slightly different perspectives. Matthew sees it one way. Mark sees it a slightly another way. Luke sees it a slightly another way. So they add little nuances to the story that each one of them remembered and picked up. But in Mark, and only in Mark, he looks at him and he loves him. He looks at this man and he loves him. Whether he was all puffed up because he was following those Ten Commandments, but he saw in him something, potential, hope, the possibility of truly having this full life. But he also sees his impediment. He sees what is holding him from living life to the fullest possible uh, capacity. And that for him is his possessions, the stuff that holds him. Because they're not really, I, I do think one of the challenges of living in a consumer society, in a consumer world, is we keep consuming, we keep needing more and more and more, and the more we need, the more those things that we need uh, really start to control our lives. You know, I'm no longer working to give glory to God. I'm working so I can pay for my next cool thing. I'm working so I can fill my house with all sorts of stuff, and believe me, this is not, you know, this is the pot calling the kettle black, buddy. You know, I am want, I want the fastest computer. I want the nicest car. You know, I want all of those things. I want them. I want them, I want them, I want them. But I don't really need them. But I want them. And those things that I spend all of my time possessing really don't possess. They, they really aren't my possessions. They possess me. One of the things that struck me, uh, in 2002, one of the things I had the opportunity to do, I went on a mission trip to Mozambique. And while I was in Mozambique, 
our summer, their winter, thank goodness, because their summer, it's 120 degrees in the shade, um, which actually for me would have been perfect. I like 120 degrees in the shade. I can actually start wearing short sleeves at that point. You know, uh, that really works for me. But it wasn't summer, it was winter. And winter for them is like 80 degrees. <laughs> so it was still okay. I, I could wear, you know, three-quarter length sleeves. So I, 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 we went to this, we were helping to build um, a school uh, in this remote village because the kids had to walk to school 10 kilometers was the closest school for them. And they had to walk through the bush and to get there in groups. And so they were building the school in this village and the name of the village was Tinga Tinga. Uh, and one of the things that struck me as I walked through the village and they were always so very welcoming to us. I mean, just every day we were doing the menial work. They hired local artisans to actually build the school. The phys you know, people who could lay the brick and, and do all that kind of stuff, they actually hired local folks for that, which made complete sense because if you wanted a crooked school, let me lay some brick. But um, that we were tamping down the floor, our whole job, tamping down the floor. I can tamp a lot of dirt. You know, give me a big stick with a weight on the end, and I can just tamp away. But their buildings had no doors. Have you noticed that the more stuff you get, the more doors you need and the more locks you have to put on there because you've got to protect your stuff. And then it's no longer stuff that you own. It's you being owned by the stuff. You are protecting it, guarding it. Your life is built around that. Jesus sees this in this guy and says, dude, you are doing everything right. But what you really need to do is this thing that's holding you so tight, you got to let it go. you got to get rid of it. You have got to let this thing go. And the thing that's holding you so tight is your stuff. you got too much of it. You don't need it. Just sell it all. Give whatever you get from that to the poor and come follow me. Now, for the longest time, I spent a lifetime, you know, arguing why this was really, this was all... This wasn't to be taken literally by us. This is just purely figurative. Don't ever sell your stuff by no means because by, it, when I start talking about that, that makes me uncomfortable. And if it makes me uncomfortable, I bet you it makes you uncomfortable talking about selling all your stuff and giving it to the poor. You know, first of all, then we got to decide which poor are the deserving poor because let's be honest, we don't want the undeserving poor to get anything as if we're the deserving rich. I, you know, we've got a list. We, we keep making all these kinds of things that... I, I'm amazed that God just didn't give up like 2,000 years ago and say, these people are not going to ever get it. I've sent my son. They killed him. Killed him because they were so disgusted by everything he taught. They're just never going to get it. Let's start over on a new planet. We're just moving away. You know, let's leave them to their own devices. But no, God just keeps loving us and keeps hoping that we'll recognize that nothing you own will ever give you meaning. And that includes your own, you know, uh, the, the personality you've adopted so everybody will like you. All of those things that you carry around with you, Jesus wants you to let go of the thing that stands between you and him. And sometimes it's, it's the desire to be thought of in a positive way. I want you all to like me every week. So I usually try to talk about something entertaining. And yeah, I probably talk about it a little bit too long for some of you. It's like, my gosh, don't you know I have a seven-minute attention span, dude? And you are talking 21 minutes. That's three times my attention span. It's like if I had to listen to three programs, three in a row. Uh, can't you give up? You know, but I want you to esteem me. So sometimes I think to myself, how could I make this message shorter? And then I plan for it, and it doesn't happen. So uh, the truth is, you know, we are all caught up in what we think everybody else ought to think about us. And that's one of the things we've got to let go of, too. How many of us measure whether we're successful or not by somebody else in our neighborhood? All the Joneses, oh, my goodness, they just got a Lexus. I guess i got to get one, too. <laughs> oh, they just got a Land Rover. Crud! I just, I haven't even finished paying off the Lexus yet. How can I afford the Land Rover? 
you know, oh, that, that James, he's got a Ford F-150. Man, I just have a, like a Ranger. I need an F-150. But instead of the XLT like he's got, I'm going to get the King Ranch. <laughs> I'm going to get the King Ranch. See, I can already, can you tell my stuff possesses me because I know that much about F-150s? It's not just a truck. I know all of the models of the trucks that exist. That's just wrong, isn't it? It is wrong because I'm possessed by that in some way. How many of you are sucked into being possessed by the very possessions you thought were going to help you out? How much time do I spend polishing my beautiful rice maker in my house because I love the Tsoji Rushi? And it makes beautiful rice for me every day. Except when I was in Utica, I was on rice withdrawal. It was bad, you know. I had the DTs at night. It was not pretty. Hannah made me a pot of rice, so when I arrived home last night, there was Seca rice in my pot <laughs> waiting for me. I love that girl. <laughs> I love that girl. I love my son, too, don't get me wrong, but... You know, he didn't make me any rice. He had the audacity to be away at college. I mean, how many things in life do we let possess us? And God wants our whole lives. The message that I see in this passage is if we're going to take Jesus seriously, I can't hold anything back. I can't hold my money back. I can't hold my car back. I can't hold my stuff back. I can't hold my time back. I can't hold my desire for you to like me back or for anybody to like me back. I can't hold anything, my own desire for esteem or security or worse than anything else in my life, control. My desire for control, I gotta let that go. Yes, I wanna control everything. I wanted to turn off the snow after the first night in Utica, guess what? There was no switch. I talked to the front desk guy, my front desk guy, Daniel, who reflected Jesus to me every day because after the first night of making me a fresh pot of coffee when I came in, I talked about coffee and how important coffee is in my life, second only to rice. He did not buy a rice maker. But Daniel, every day when I came in, saw me and he said, go up, go to your room, take off your coat, kick off your shoes, 10 minutes, come back down, there'll be a fresh pot of coffee for you, James. Daniel told me that every day. It was like being at home. Now, if he had just gotten a Tsoji Rushi, I wouldn't have come home. I would still be in Utica. Okay. Okay. How obsessed can we be with things other than God? Well, if we're anything like this man in the story, I'll pretty obsessed. Pretty obsessed with our success, our desire to be seen, our desire to be in control, our security, all those things take over in our lives. So the question for you today and for this week is to, to frame your life. What is really the most important thing? If somebody were to look at you from the outside, what would they see when they really framed in? Not the peripherals. When they really framed in on you, what would they see is most important? If they listened to enough of my messages online, they would, they would think, well, I thought Jesus should be really important, but he has talked about the Tsochi Rushi so much. I think he worships that thing. Does he have a little altar table in the living room for it? Does he light candles next to it? Don't anyone come to the house and see. So, you know, what does your life say about who you are? When you run up to Jesus and say, what will it take for me to inherit eternal life? Know that when you ask that question, he looks at you and he wants you to have the fullest life. He looks at you in love, just like that young man, just like the young women and young men in this room. He looks at you. He wants you to have the fullest life. What is he going to ask you to let go of? What is that one thing you cannot let go of that you think defines you now, if it's your faith, by all means, hold on to that bad boy. But the challenge is for most of us, that's not what we're holding on to too tight. If I can't go home right now and give my Tsoji Rushi away to the nearest family who needs rice, then the Tsoji Rushi owns me. And Jesus might say, James, that's got to go. And I'll have
have to go back to boiling it on the stove. That would just be bad. I mean, what is holding you? So your assignment this week, when people look at you, what do you think they see has got a hold of you? What will Jesus ask you as he looks at you in love to let go of? And then the hard question, can you let it go? What's your first step? I'm not asking you to get all 22 steps to getting rid of whatever it is in your life this week. What is going to be your first step to letting go of the thing that's got a hold of you? One step. What's the one step? Next week, we wrap up the, the Taking Jesus Seriously series. Sort of we wrap it up because Easter is kind of captures that same piece. <laughs>